And Jesus himself said that he did not come to do away with the law. This is the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast with your hosts, Michael Campbell and Greg Howell. Welcome to the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast. Uh, This is Greg Howell, and I've got my co-host here in person for a change, Dr. Michael Campbell. Um, Excited that we can hang out together on the West Coast. I'm super excited about it. It kind of happened and didn't, and then we thought it wasn't, and then it suddenly did happen. So I'm really excited about that. Um, But welcome to this latest episode of the podcast. I missed out on the last one, and I hear I missed... You should be ashamed of yourself going and having vacation. I I kind of am, but I'm not, because vacation was... just giving you a hard time. Absolutely fantastic. You totally deserve it. It was great. It was great. But I'm glad to be back here. And frankly, this is the first live and in-person podcast we've been able to do. So this one's going to be really cool. And today we've got a special guest who's on. Uh, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about who we have here? Well, we're just delighted that we can have uh, Dr. Jim Wibberding here with us. He's the uh, new chair of the religion department at Pacific Union College. Has been teaching here, I think, what, about five years? And uh, professor of religion and... Uh, has a rich background in, in both pastoral ministry as well as a scholar. Uh, and so he brings back uh, or to the classroom just a passion for teaching uh, here on the campus here at Pacific Union College as well as making a broader contribution to our church. So, uh, Jim, a warm welcome. Thanks for joining the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I have you in my office today. In your office. That's yes. right. Thanks for letting us crash your office. I was going to say, we are, we are on location on in location. Anglin, California, Pacific Union College. And so. I, I might mention that I've known Jim for quite a few years, all the way back to when we were students together in the 90s at Southern. So hard yes, to believe. Indeed. So it's a kind of a reunion of sorts uh, in many different ways. So, Well, uh, Jim, thanks for joining us. And uh, we want to kind of get into... Uh, a little bit here you've been uh, both pastoring as well as serving as a teacher here on the west coast and i know you've been teaching some adventist history and uh, not too long ago you found something that has eluded adventist historians for quite a long time and that is a certain grave tell us whose grave you found and why that person's significant Yes, yes. This is a pretty exciting find, and it's been, I spent maybe three years looking for it, um, and I know others had before, but of course I'm here on location. The person we found was the first, as far as I know, the first Adventist to preach the Adventist message full length in California, Merritt Kellogg. Uh, brother, older brother of John Harvey Kellogg, and uh, in 1859 he came across country with his wife Louisa and their three kids at the time. Uh, like the old wagon train? Yes, yes, ox cart actually, part of the way, uh, and, and by foot. He actually bought two pairs of new shoes when he left Jackson, Michigan, and those uh, soles were fastened on with wooden pegs. And so as he walked along beside the cart, those pegs started coming out. And he said he he walked several hundred miles barefoot to get to California. Oh, my word. Yeah. I can't imagine. (laughs) And I tried to add those pegs back if I was in. Yeah, I don't know what he was thinking. But uh, yeah, so that was a that was an exciting find, mm-hmm. and we yeah. found it in Hillsburg at the Oak Mound Cemetery. Yeah, and it's just this little marker, maybe six or eight inches wide, that says MGK. Yeah. So it took us a bit of uh, extra work to make sure that really was him, but it was. Well, I can't believe you found this because I remember doing an Adventist heritage tour with uh, Jim Nix and Merlin Burt years ago with the uh, Adventist librarians, and remember uh, I remember Merlin in particular talking about how he wished he could find that grave. So I know there's been people trouncing around in that cemetery hoping to find something. So here he is, first real Adventist, do we dare say missionary, to the West Coast, to California. And and, and how did you know this was his grave? Well, that's an interesting background. I think it was you, Michael, the, who actually mentioned to me that it was a grave that was not able to be found. I was, I was more and more curious as I came to did PUC. Did I you? Yes, you did. You kind of <laughs> sucked me in. Like, um, well, I'm glad that there was some fruit to this. <laughs> the obsession yeah. begins. Yes, yes, it did. Oh, man. His obsession did begin. So anyway, I, I knew that it was one that we couldn't find, and I just right. thought we, there had to be some way. So I started you know, digging through the archives. I found vital records. I found his burial record. Uh, but what really, the first one that clued me into any sort of location was uh, an obituary in the newspaper that said it was at Oak Mound Cemetery. 
So yeah, I was all excited. I told my wife and kids we were gonna go over and we we're gonna find this grave and we arrived. And we talked to the lady there and she looks in the file and uh, we got nothing, right? So it wasn't as easy as I'd hoped. <clears throat> so we, uh, you know, it was several months later that, uh, you know, COVID came in and we all kind of didn't go to church for a while. Mm -hmm. So we needed something spiritually meaningful to do on a Sabbath morning. My brother was here and my oldest daughter said she would go and we headed out to the cemetery and we just started digging. I mean, literally right. digging. Catch this. You're in the middle of COVID pandemic and your first thought is to go to the cemetery for a spiritual experience. And, and grave rub. It, <laughs> well, I did We're say digging. We're a bad time. <laughs> no, I mean... I don't know if you've you've been to Oak Mountain Cemetery, yes. and there are portions of it that are just kind of overgrown, and yeah. the gravestones have fallen down and been mm -hmm. buried. And so we were excavating stones, trying to read them. And uh, my daughter and I were stuck in the woods. Uh, there was a family of deer watching us that morning. Mm. And my brother said, "Hey, I think I found something." So it was actually my brother who found it. Oh, but really? don't don't tell anybody. Lonnie, okay? Lonnie's the one. Lonnie, that did it. All right. Lonnie, Lonnie actually Shout out spotted to Lonnie, it. Lonnie, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so then we, you know, of course, rushed over there, and it says MGK. Mm. And the first thing I noticed was it's 1833 to 1921, and he was born in 1832. Mm -hmm. So everything matched except for that one digit, mm -hmm. right? So I, uh, you know, was looking through the vital records, and, and I found that on the death certificate, it didn't give a birth date. Yeah. So I thought, well, okay, maybe they just miscalculated or something. Um, so I sent pictures to, to you, Michael. I don't, yeah. You probably remember this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all the uh, details that were making me think this was the, this was the grave. And uh, then on Monday, I called the lady at the cemetery. And she was able to, uh, by the graves next to him, find the grave number. And then look in the old files for that grave number. And sure enough, there was... There was a record for Merrick Gardner nice, Kellogg. Nice, nice. So what was it? Well, and this, you know, by the way, this, this kind of explains, I think, discrepancies in history that history is not always neat and clean and tidy, that sometimes mm -hmm. there can be inconsistencies. A, a record or a number or a digit could be missed, but it doesn't mean you haven't actually discovered it, but you do need to eliminate the possibility that you haven't, you know, you're not just jumping on something because you're so excited about it, but to... Uh, to verify so it yeah. shows kind of the the trickiness that comes with having to do you know sleuthing <laughs> mm -hmm. historical sleuthing well what a great discovery Jim I, I think this is fantastic so um, I we could probably talk all, the whole episode about Merrick Kellogg but I know you've had something up else up your sleeve you've been teaching Adventist history at Laura your wife's also been teaching Adventist history but this last semester you were teaching a new class. Uh, tell us what you were teaching and, and how did that come about? Yeah, so we developed a class on uh, women in Adventist history. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, this is not something that's been done, or at least not done much, at our Adventist institution. So it's a new endeavor. Yeah. And the challenge with that is there's not a textbook for it. So this meant this a is deep... tragic, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> this meant a deep dive into... Mm -hmm archives, yeah. just uh, one biography at a time. Uh, but one of the interesting challenges was that there were so many potential biographies to cover. Mm. And in a 10-week quarter, uh, meeting three days a week, at most you can cover about 30 if you, yeah. if you cover them in depth. <laughs> each. Right. And so the challenge was, you know, who do we not talk about? Right. Yeah. There's just so many of these stories. Uh, by the way, I, I, I want to pause for reflection because, you know, sometimes I have people that talk to me and say, you know, well, if women were so significant, so influential in the founding of Adventism, how come I haven't heard about them? And I think the answer to that's really quite simple. It's just the fact that their stories haven't been told. Yeah. And I think there's a little bias that goes into that too. Yeah. I noticed in the case of Maud Sisley. Now, Maud Sisley was an amazing um, pioneer. She yeah. was. Uh, her family was uh, converted about, she was about 11 years old or so. I think it was 14 or 15. She goes to work for the Review and Herald there in Battle Creek mm -hmm. and spends <clears throat> significant time there. And then she has the burden to go out and do her own mission. Mm -hmm. So she heads off to Ohio with a friend, Elsie Gates, mm -hmm. and they just do mission. Just like nobody's there. They're just going to do their thing. Uh, and so then uh, J.H. Wagner comes through town and does a big tent meeting, of course, gets credit for the the souls one yeah. but he 
<clears throat> apparently noticed that there was something there because word gets back to Battle Creek that Maud can leap. Mm. And so she is quickly sent off to um, places like South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, first she was sent to Switzerland Europe, to help, yeah. to help uh, uh, yeah, John Andrews get mm -hmm. the printing business off the ground. Um, so she's this significant name. Then John Loughborough is doing his thing over in uh, England, trying to get an official sort of organization for the church there. So he calls for her to come there by name. Um, she goes to South Africa. She eventually goes to uh, help Ellen White at Avondale. So this is a big name, right? Well, somewhere along the way, she gets married to Charles Boyd. And <clears throat> now in the records, instead of seeing Maud Sicily and a report of what she did, you have uh, reports of Charles Boyd and wife. Mm. So she's reduced to and wife. Yeah. And it was interesting to notice that many of the women whose names we continued to know never got married. Yeah. So there's probably a gender uh, equity issue yeah. here yeah. that's affected whether we tell the stories or not. Well, I, I can think of many different times in Avenger's history and historiography where the name of the spouse isn't there. It's just uh, Elder and Mrs. and they'll have their name. And you actually have to do quite a bit of hunting and sleuthing to figure out even what their actual name was to, to find the kind of information that you're talking about, Jim. Yeah, it was kind of fun. In, uh, I teach a class on Intro to Adventism, which is kind of Adventist history light for those who don't have Adventist background. And I found myself telling the story of Merritt Kellogg. Yeah. And Oh, he had a wife, too. And John Loughborough, big Adventist pioneer for California. And, oh, yeah, and he was married. What was her name? And I realized these, these women were very much at the center of the development of the movement, but we've somehow forgotten their names. And so that was part of what sparked my interest in developing yeah. that class. Love it. Yeah. Love it. And, and by the way, how did, how did students respond? I mean, this is a new class. What would you, what, you know? Yeah, it, very well. It was added to the schedule fairly late, but it filled up with 25 students. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, they were fairly enthralled, especially with one particular guest speaker who I invited in via Zoom, Michael W. Campbell. I don't know who that is. Yeah. No, they I were. Heard he's a heretic. <laughs> Actually, but they might have been more Come enthralled with Heidi Campbell. I just I have to tell you that. I think she's definitely the better looking and the smarter of the two. Yeah, no. No, but uh, they responded very well. And what they were struck by is the same thing I was struck by, is how many stories of women who did extraordinary things yeah. to shape Adventism as we know it are there and we just haven't told them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so telling the stories and students are enthralled. And I think if I heard right, you had them do their own research projects too. So they're also discovering even more stories than the ones that you would bring up in class, I would imagine, right? Yes, yes. Uh, several of them submitted articles for the uh, Adventist Encyclopedia. The new one, yeah. The new one mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll see which, how many of them are published. I think several will be. Mm -hmm. um, but that gave them an opportunity to explore beyond the 30 or so names that I could we could cover in class right. sessions. They got to cover additional names and share those with their classmates too. Mm. So they share their nice. projects in a small way, a little video they produce to share the story with their classmates. Well, so far I've been asking a lot of questions, Greg. I feel like uh, you haven't been helping out a much. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm digging around in vacation mode. Right? I am a little bit, that's okay. I'm, most of the time I'm in vacation mode. That's a, that's a general idea. It's summertime. It, it is, teacher, it is. You know. teacher's time. Um, I was curious, honestly, to hear what did you feel um, was the response, not just from students, um, but in uh, the in your own personal look at, at church, because I know as historians we always talk about history from the margins, right? Sure. Just looking at people's stories outside of the mainstream. Um, the official narrative. Exactly, yeah. yeah. How do you feel that a class like this is adding to not just the the felt need of a generation of students now, but how are we adding to Adventist history by telling more of these stories um, and filling in some of the gaps that, you know, have and intentionally or un unintentionally kind of formed over the decades? Yeah, that's a good question. I, there are several ways we could answer that, I suppose. Um, good for reflection, though. <clears throat> I think there's a, one aspect of this is that we have chosen certain stories to tell mm -hmm. because of what they say. And so there's a certain narrative or mega meta narrative, a uh, certain collection of narratives. A historiography we prefer. That we've been handed, yes. Mm -hmm. And handed for a purpose or a series of purposes to communicate big ideas. 
And so I think one of the values of rediscovering some of those stories that haven't been told is to get a broader perspective on the truth of our Adventist heritage. And I think it's a richer perspective. Um, More holistic, maybe? In terms yeah. Of, yeah. I think we find stories that can resonate with more among our number today. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the, the female stories certainly resonate better with my daughters than uh, John Loughborough, as, as amazing as he was. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So they're looking to the past, trying to look for inspiration of, mm -hmm. of people in the past. I like that. It sounds like also the it, com it makes it more complicated too. There's a complexity too um, the, to our past. Go ahead, Jim. Well, and in the process of that, I think it's not just what we're looking for that we find. Mm -hmm. We find additional, uh, we make additional discoveries mm -hmm. about uh, you know their theological perspectives. Sure. And the the variety of theological perspectives in the past. Mm -hmm. um, one of the discoveries that I've I've made in that process, and also looking at Merrick Kellogg and seeing mm -hmm. some of the details of his story and the things reported in the newspaper that weren't reported in the Adventist periodicals, <laughs> such as his presence at a dance, where well, they danced till midnight, and they fed, uh, they made he made the candy for the candy pole, you know, back here in Pope <laughs> Valley, and uh, some so of maybe that stuff. There was a little bit more of. Um, more of a breadth in terms of the, even in terms of lifestyle, how, how people viewed things then. Yes, yes, I think so. Mm. And, you know, there's a West Coast uh, DNA to Adventism that's a little different than some other parts Apparently of the country. Back to Merritt Kellogg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Merritt, up through Jones and Wagner and everybody else. And went yes. forward, right? Like, come on. <laughs> We've made some contributions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, tell us about some of these other women that you discovered. Um, I'm thinking in particular about Ruth Temple. It's a story I knew a little bit about, but you've really done a deep deep dive on Ruth Temple. Tell us uh, maybe a little bit about her. Yeah, I can tell you some things about Ruth Temple. Actually, Benjamin Baker was one of the guests in the class, and he talked in depth about her. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I hadn't known is how much she did in terms of uh, public health, like during her time in Los Angeles areas mm -hmm. where she was, she uh, developed medical facilities. I mean, there wasn't a, there wasn't a health care infrastructure mm -hmm. and she developed that. She also helped to address through very practical methods, um, spread of STDs, okay. sure. uh, actually helped to, to so eradicate health education. What was that? Public health education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she helped to eradicate the actual plague. The actual plague was the plague. Uh, really? Yes, the yes. plague and some others. You know, the, the flu and she That's was intense right there. Part of all that. What time frame are we talking here? So this is um, she lived. Uh, you're gonna quiz me, man. Uh, she, <laughs> man she, gonna gonna she lived I'm into, gonna, uh, I believe, the early '70s or so. But okay, okay. you know, 60s, around '70s. Yeah, but that was. Uh, so we're talking the 1920s and mm. thereabouts, 1930s. Wow. Um, she was. Let's see. She was. Um, a 13-year-old kid when uh, Jenny Ireland, who was actually another woman we, we studied in the class, uh, her mentor, came in to a community, a black community near Los Angeles called the Furlong Tract okay. neighborhood and planted an Adventist church. Great. And it was out of that church that, you know, she, uh, her mother, Amy Temple, uh, became a Bible worker and Ruth caught the vision for healthcare because of the stories Jenny taught her, told her yeah. about women who were doctors in Battle Creek. Like, I could be a doctor? And it set a trajectory for her life. Wow. Um, she did some extraordinary things. So wait a minute, we have, we have actually a, a history and precedent of women empowering other women, providing health education and leadership in the church. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I would be happy to talk about Jenny Ireland, too, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, tell us. Uh, some of our <laughs> listeners have probably never heard of her. Yeah, so back to Ruth Temple. Ruth Temple was the first black uh, woman to be licensed as a doctor in the state of California. <clears throat> so that was a pretty, you know, nice uh, little, uh, I guess, boasting point. You know? <laughs> but Jenny Ireland, um, she, was a, she was a Hillsburg kid. Uh, she had been born in Pacheco, California, and her mother moved her up to Hillsburg along with her three siblings to attend Hillsburg when it opened in 1882. And then she was pretty young at that time. She went through the whole school process, and then she shipped off to Battle Creek and, and took the nursing course. In 1896, she ended up down in Los Angeles with a friend, uh, and their purpose was to start some public health, uh, to 
there was a recognition that there just wasn't availability of good health uh, care, and so they just struck out on their own. Um, John Loughborough helped to fund the two of them a little bit, sent them some money every now and then, sent them letters of encouragement, and she spent uh, about 10 years doing that until uh, somewhere along the way she started working for the Southern California Conference, uh, held about every secretarial position in the conference, except for educational, uh, and she spent about 75 years with the church. Anyway, wow. so that's a, that's a long time. But about after 10 years of, of establishing healthcare facilities, she really had a burden for this new community for a long tract. And she decided to go into Bible work. Mm -hmm. So one day she shared her vision with the prayer meeting at the central church down there. Mm -hmm. And a friend after the prayer meeting called her and said, oh, my postman, uh, I think he lives in Furlong Tract. So the two of them went out hunting for the postman as he's running his routes and accost him on the street and say, can we have a Bible study in your home? And he's, uh, I think my wife would be okay with that. Uh, and he was a, a Mr. Troy, uh, Postman Troy. And his son, Owen Troy, would eventually become the first Seventh-day Adventist to get a doctoral degree in theology, graduated here from PUC uh, in 1922. But uh, just fascinating how she managed to partner with this community that was extremely forward-thinking, a black community. She was a white woman, and there was just a resonance there, and she became an incredibly empowering leader. She started the church, she pastored it for six years, went on with a couple of her protégés from that church and started another, uh, developed some really innovative uh, evangelistic methods, and taught them for the next several decades to others. And she was so successful that Owen Troy, you know, the little post, the postman's son, mm -hmm. who grew up and eventually got his doctorate degree in theology, after he graduated with theology here from PUC, he went on, uh, went back to work with Jenny so he could learn more of her evangelistic methods. And that was his real evangelistic education. By the way, I'm just gonna interject this here that uh, Jim Wibberding showed me in the walls the corridor here, the building where he's at, the graduating class where it has a picture of Owen Troy, and we're going to put that in the show notes if it's okay, so that any of our listeners that want to see a picture of the first Adventist with a PhD in religion, uh, <laughs> what that person looked like. Go ahead, Jim. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I could just ramble on, and I don't want to do that, but what I, what I do want to note is that empowerment aspect, because you see... Jenny starts this church, you get Ruth Temple out of that church, you get Owen Troy out of that church, you get Arna Bontom, one of the architects of the uh, Harlem Renaissance out of that church, and several other leaders, that uh, some of whom we came to know, we came mm -hmm. to know their names, and others of whom just continued to do ministry their entire lives. Yeah. There was this lady, uh, I think her name was Estelle Hendricks, who when her obituary was written, it mentioned Jenny Ireland. And several of these people, when their obituary was written and the few important facts of their lives were put down, Jenny Ireland was mentioned as a key moment in their life direction. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's Estelle. She was a Bible worker for the rest of her life. There was Amy Temple. There were just a whole cadre mm -hmm. of people that she empowered, many of them women. By the way, I just have to always pause about the process because you're, you're searching online newspapers. So hmm. thanks to digitization, uh, people like you are able to kind of help make these connections that wouldn't have been possible or at least very easy, easily recognizable without all of the, the, the mass digitization of resources like this. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's a lot of fun. Yeah. I appreciate all those people who put all you're, the hours into creating that well, for me. Well, you're one of those doing that, Jim. <laughs> you're you're yeah. plowing through this stuff. I love it. So but you promised us a little more on Jenny Ireland, too. Yeah, so Jenny Ireland uh, continued on. She worked uh, for about yeah, 75 years for the church. Mm -hmm. And she was just the consummate empowerer. Mm -hmm. uh, she was developing Bible studies. You can look in the old ministry magazines and she's printing, publishing her latest Bible study. She was very concerned about uh, a gospel orientation to that. So she's and very evangelistic. She's very evangelistic. Um, but I think that I, what I would point to most is her her empowerment and per perhaps secondarily her ability to partner with those who were forward thinking, who could benefit from her partnership. Sure. Uh, I don't see her work with the black community in Los Angeles as a case of paternalism. Right. Instead, it's this 
she resonated with their with their ambition, their optimism, and said, "I want to be part of that," mm -hmm. and help, and uh, contributed c tremendously to the community. Yeah, yeah. So you've taught this class. You yes. Teach it again. Oh yes, yes, yes. I have to. <laughs> you just see the twinkle in your eye. I mean, that's that's why it's fun <laughs> to interview in person. Uh, you have a passion. But the quandary is: okay. Do I cover the same biographies next time, or do I have a whole additional set of thirty? Well, what's your gut feeling tell you? Oh, I don't know. It was a lot of work the first time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should repeat these one more time. Right? Half, there you go. Half right? and half, half and half. Maybe, maybe mix it up a little bit. Yes. Every time. Yeah. Well, great. What a great class. I uh, wish I was somehow closer to be able to sit at uh, and just learn alongside your students because uh, uh, just a great opportunity to, to really understand in a much more nuanced way. Um, our Adventist past. Yeah. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to ramble on here, but something else, you mentioned the archives and the yeah. availability of archives. And I think what, one of the things that the availability of the archives does for me is to provide textures of these mm -hmm. people's experiences. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Merrick Kellogg and he's in a dance, right? right. Uh, scandalous, right? <laughs> it wasn't in the Adventist Review, it was in the local paper. I'm just saying. But you also have other things such as his family. He had a stepson. He married Louisa Kellogg and she was, um, she was about 10 years older than him and she already had two children, Anna and Alvin. And uh, by searching through the newspaper archives, I discovered that Alvin had serious mental health issues. And so uh, he actually committed suicide. Sure and so you have this, this you have this, uh, aspect of his life experience as he's working with this stepson who's who's volatile emotionally mm -hmm. who can be violent mm -hmm. um, who's threatening his mother and things like this and somehow they manage through that type of a crisis and I think that's important because sometimes we can really um, kind of clean up our Adventist mm -hmm. pioneers and they have this shiny perfect sort of life and, the, the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and when I when I look at my life it's complicated sometimes uh, maybe lots of times, right? Um, but somehow they managed to, you know, hang on to God and, and continue the mission and they made a contribution. And so I think it's important to understand those textures. And so the archives the can help that. right? Yeah, yes. They, these were real people. And w while we celebrate the good things, we also acknowledge their humanness and challenges. Yes. Yeah. What do we what do we do with that? Because as you said, it's great to have texture. I find that I relate to people in the past more if I know more about them. Um, what, what happens when we threaten the 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 veneer of of what has been already told about some of these people? Because it's one thing to come find up, you know, a brand new person, you know, that nobody really knows anything about and hasn't had a chance to really get this rose-eyed picture of. What happens when we start to un cover some of the nuances that are less than savory. Um, how, how as historians can we offer that without f making it feel like a threat to the larger, you know? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. My daughter was just talking today about a, a friend who, well-meaning, uh, gently corrected her when she was talking about our first uh, general conference president and how he was a you know, meat eater and drank coffee and things. Uh, wanting to not uh, malign his character, the friend wasn't. Uh, but I think that helps us to understand that these are real people and they, they weren't all kind of monolithic. They didn't all fit in the same box. Mm -hmm. And that's good. That's good because we don't all fit in the same box. Maybe maybe there's room for you too, Greg. I, mean, <laughs> I so. hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, I've been ill-informed. Ill uh, yeah. But you're right that there's that, that knee-jerk response. We don't want to... We don't want to... Uh, messy this image, this mm -hmm. perfect kind of heroic uh, narrative that we have. But I think that most people, maybe I'm too optimistic about this, uh, I think that most people really do want to know the real story mm -hmm. and they do want to be able to uh, identify with some of our Adventist forebears. And so I think we can do it. You know, we might get some pushback, but I think that there will be more people jumping up saying, that's cool, than there will be people saying, hey, stop that. Don't tell us those, that, those facts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're probably not even facts. You made those up. You know? Right. Yeah. Sort of this, uh, you know, constructive ways of, of learning from the past. Yeah. You know, while still being um, honest and, and not just sugarcoating what we don't want to necessarily see. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, Jim, thank you for sharing this. You know, you've, you've made some really exciting discoveries that I'm uh, delighted that our listeners can um, learn a little bit more about. Um, you know, there might be somebody that's saying, you know, I really love Adventist history. I love these stories. Uh, where would you point them to for more information or where do you see things going in the future? Yeah, I I would point anybody who's willing to to get oriented to it to the archives yeah because you can explore Start anything digging. yeah go to the adventist archives of the general conference go to uh, newspaper archives there's mm -hmm. chronically in america uh, mm -hmm. state uh, universities often have them Great resources. go to the vital records mm -hmm. uh various places have that there's a, f a free family search uh mm -hmm. source that, ancestry com. ancestry com. yes mm -hmm. um and you can pull up some vital records and you know, it's it's just Fascinating to find a fact and then follow it up. One of the women that I was uh, exploring was Minnie Sipe. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at her story and she mentions that her son died. Mm -hmm. That's all she mentions. And I, I thought, okay, maybe I can find a death certificate. So I did. And on the death certificate, it says, died of a blow inflicted by Burt Rowway. Like, who's Burt <laughs> Rowway? What happened here? <laughs> and so I... Uh, you know, I, I began to look through newspaper archives. I looked up Bert's name and sure enough, he shows up in the right place. And, and it was, a, you know, it's an incredibly sad story, actually. Uh, you know, Minnie Sipes' son died and Bert Rowry then committed suicide in prison. And, but it's a whole part of that woman's experience, mm -hmm. who was this extraordinary leader. She was a pastor. She was an evangelist. She was a conference administrator. She did all kinds of amazing things. And she had this deep tragedy in her life, this terrible mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so to find a clue like that and then just follow it up in the archives is the most fun way to go. But, you know, we've, we've had several exciting publications recently. There's this guy, Michael W. Campbell, who's written a couple of good books recently. Um, 1920 something. 19, 1919, 1922. <laughs> Uh, there's there's actually quite a bit being published. I would go to some of the biographies. Um, mm -hmm. Pacific Press has some of the you know the those encyclopedia. brown brown colored mm -hmm. biographies. You could go to the uh, yes the encyclopedia online is amazing mm -hmm. because you can just browse and you learn stories you never knew, and it's free. So yeah, yeah. so much more that needs to be done. Yeah, there's just uh, especially in the 20th century, we're just kind of scratching the surface. It feels like. Yeah. Well, uh, Jim, thanks for joining us for the Adventist Pilgrimage podcast, and uh, I look, I'm look, actually already enthralled and excited to see what new discoveries you're going to make. And everybody who's listening to us, thanks again for being uh, faithful listeners. I guess we, uh, we crossed a little bit of a threshold here this month. We had over 1,000 downloads, uh, so that's kind of a big jump here for our podcast. And Jim, thanks for uh, being part of that and for being part of our ongoing quest to find out new things in Adventist history. Thanks a lot. We hope to hear you again next time. And Jesus himself said that he did not come to do away with the law. He does not take us out of this world if he does not want us to be contaminated by.